Hey everybody, welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Super excited, back after a few weeks of, uh, of not being here. So um, tonight I wanna talk about a topic that I think is um, very important and it's one of those areas where largely it's a myth. The disease itself, osteoporosis is what we're talking about, or bone loss. Let me get another pen, that one's going out on me. There we go. Bone loss, osteoporosis, myths are what we're really dialing into tonight because so many of you have been told that you have osteoporosis or osteopenia, which is kind of a, a way to call it pre-osteoporosis, right? When in fact, um, Osteoporosis itself, as the way that it's diagnosed, is, is, is arguably a complete myth. And let's dive into what I mean by that. But before we do, let's grab... Here we go. So before we do, let's, uh, let's, take, um, let's take on some of, some of you guys are, are filtering in with some of your questions. But you know the rules. Uh, if you're chiming in, if you're tuning in, let me know who you are. Let me know where you're coming from. And... Um, you know, join into the conversation. Okay, let's see here. Sorry guys, my phone is slowing down on me. I'm not trying to ignore you here. Okay. Okay, here we go. All right, so yeah, if you're tuning in tonight, let me know where you're tuning in from. Say hello. You know the rules. I like to know how far we're reaching out into the world. So uh, don't be a stranger and say hi. Looks like we've got, uh, man, I tell you what, Canada and Australia always represents really strong. Nora from Alberta, Canada, and Colin from San Diego. Rufina from Arizona, and, uh, oh, that's an easy question, Rufina. Can kids get osteoporosis? Not very likely. They can, they can have bone loss or they can have reduction in bone mineral density as a result of uh, vitamin D and calcium deficiency, predominantly vitamin D deficiency, which is technically not osteoporosis, but it's another disease called rickets. Uh, which kids can get when they are vitamin D deficient. Uh, Cody from Manchester, UK, United Kingdom. All right. So again, keep chiming in, letting me know. Tell me hello and let me know how far we're reaching out there in the world to communicate to you guys. So, all right. Okay. Yeah, so Linda's chiming in. Uh, Marcia Smith from my backyard in Houston. Uh, we got, I don't know, I'm going to mangle this name. Giulia, I think. Maybe I didn't mangle it. I don't know. You can tell me. Uh, I'm sorry if I did. Hi from Australia. And uh, Deepa. Hey, what's going on, Deepa? From Toronto. So, yeah, welcome Jillian from Modesto, California. Keep chiming in, folks. Let's dive into the conversation, though. We can talk to each other that way all night. So, osteoporosis pre- osteoporosis or osteopenia and bone loss myths. Now, what I want you to understand about it being a myth is this. 1994 is when the definition of osteoporosis changed. Before 1994, osteoporosis was really considered a disease of the elderly. So people would get so old that they might have fractures, but it was a really arguably a very rare disease. Not a lot of people had it. Not a, people, not a lot of people even really knew about it. But in 1994, something interesting happened. We got this machine invented called the Bone Mineral Density Scan. Some people refer to it as a DEXA machine. So if you've had that X-ray, dual X-ray absorbitometry machine, if you've had that done, um, 
you know, they, they measured the density of how much x-ray was able to penetrate through your bone in your spine, right, in your lumbar spine. They, they measure in the hips, and sometimes they measure in the, in the heel, in the calcaneal bone. So this happened in 1994, and it reclassified the definition of osteoporosis. Now, the problem with these bone mineral density scanners is, number one, the data of what bone should look like is based on young women. Now, a lot of you who get this diagnosis don't realize that you're being basically compared to women who are 35 years of age. And so many of you who are getting these scans are 50, 60, 65 plus. You can't compare a 35 year old with a 65 year old. So there's no great data that says um, that a 35 year old's bone should be equal to a 65 year old's bone. I mean, if we look at bone growth and the way it happens is from an early age, we have slow, steady increase in bone growth. And then around the age of 35, it peaks out and it goes there for a while. And then there's a slow, steady decline in bone as you age. So it's kind of a, a curve, it's, you know, so again, think of this as early life. Think of this as 35 and then coming over here, you know, 65 plus. So we're going to have a decline in bone when we compare ourselves to a 35 year old. Many people are going to have this decline. So I want you to first of all understand that the whole premise of basing your bone, if you're not 35, on somebody who is 35 is not a fair comparison. And in that regard, it's very, it can be very, very misleading. So if you've got a, a bone density scan that has, and the doctors told you you have osteopenia or osteoporosis or you know, a, 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 a score uh, of two and a half standard deviations away from the norm, then what they're basically telling you is that your bone doesn't absorb x-ray very well as compared to a 35-year-old female. Now that doesn't mean you have poor bone density. That doesn't mean that you have unhealthy bone. The bone scan doesn't tell you the quality of the bone that you have. It only tells you how much or what the ability of your bone is to absorb x-rays. That's not bone health. That's bone absorbing x-rays. Again, what makes up bone health? Bone is a structure that in your, you know, your body regenerates bone. About every seven years, you have a brand new skeleton. And it's, so it's kind of like on a teeter-totter. We are breaking bone down. And it's balanced for most people by building new bone. And so if there's this constant breakdown, this constant build up, what we want is we want it to be balanced out. We don't want to have very, very highly aggressive breakdown of our bone without new bone being created. And so in this regard, that could be a problem, but a DEXA scan is not measuring that. A DEXA scan doesn't tell you how fast you're making new bone versus how fast you're breaking down bone. A DEXA scan measures how much x-ray your bone absorbs compared to how much x-ray a 35 year old woman's bone absorbs. So it's not, again, it's not a fair comparison. And I want you to understand this because the definition itself is really misleading. To say that you have osteoporosis and call it a disease is extremely misleading. And we'll talk more about that as we get into some of the medicines that are being recommended and the billion dollar industry that's emerged from calling bone loss or osteoporosis and defining it as, as less than a 35 year old's bone. So we want to build new bone uh, roughly as fast as we're breaking bone down. And we want this process to go back and forth. In essence, we don't want to not break bone down. And here's why. When your bone gets old, okay, and it becomes damaged, we want to break down those old damaged cells, those old damaged tissues, and we want to replace it with new tissue. Just like when your skin starts to age, it, it sloughs off and you replace it with new skin, right? Every cell in your body is replicating and making new, new copies of itself. As it ages, it replaces itself. And we don't want our bone to stop doing that either. So understand that you do break bone down, but you do it for a reason. You're trying to replace it with building in healthy new bone. And if we call this a disease, again, we're going to run into some problems because one of the issues that we have with bone is if you get the diagnosis, 
then one of the first things that happens is you get put on mostly bisphosphonates. Let me spell that right for you. So it's a class of medication that stops this, right? What bisphosphonates do is they, in a sense, stop that from happening, stop your bone from breaking down. And so it stops you from taking and breaking down old bone and building new bone in its stead because it's blocking the breakdown of new bone and it's driving minerals into the bone and it makes your bone more brittle. If you've ever handled a raw bone, it's pliable. It's strong and it's pliable. It's bendable, right? It's because it's back, the backbone of bone, pun intended, right? The backbone or the architecture inside the bone is mostly collagen. Collagen's a protein. And then what your body does is it, in that protein matrix, it shoves minerals to make it harder, but not to make it brittle so that it snaps. Taking bisphosphonates for long periods of time, we've seen this in a number of studies, it stops the breakdown of bone and it allows for the mineralization of bone, so it makes the bone harder. So what happens is these women who take these medications, when they get their DEXA scan, it improves. It improves because the more mineral is in a bone, the more x-rays that bone is going to absorb. And so that woman is thinking, oh, my bone is much more healthy, when in fact her bone is actually much more brittle because of over mineralization of the bone. So you've got to be very, very cautious about how taking a, a simple DEXA or bone scan and taking that information and getting on a medicine for the rest of your life because of the fear that you might have a fracture, because that's what it is. Osteoporosis is a completely asymptomatic disorder. You don't know it's a problem until the doctor does the scan and tells you that it's a problem. And then the fear of, of the fact that it might be a problem is used as a tool to get people to take drugs as a preventative, even though that 63% of fractures occur in people with the highest DEXA scan. So this is just, this was a study published at, from Leeds University. 63% of fractures in this study were more common in people with the highest bone density, not the lowest bone density. So we know the DEXA scan itself is not a very valuable tool at assessing the overall health of bone. It again, I keep saying this, but it is a measure of how well your bone absorbs x-ray. It's not a measure of the nutritional status of your bone, how many nutrients are getting into your bone, whether your vitamin D and your calcium, your magnesium, your boron, your vanadium, your vitamin K, your collagen or your protein intake, whether all these things are adequate enough to support good bone growth and good bone repair. It's not assessing, a DEXA scan does not assess the architecture of the bone. It doesn't assess the strength of the bone. It's not a functional test. It's simply a test that measures x-ray absorption. So we don't want to necessarily rely on it to make a decision to take a medicine for the rest of our lives that stop the breakdown of bone, stopping this balance between building new bone and breaking down bone appropriately. One of the side effects to these medications, because this is where the real problem comes in, if you're taking these drugs, these drugs have been shown to cause microfractures. It goes back to what I said before. Microfractures are caused as a result of inhibiting the healthy process of getting rid of old damaged bone tissue. So when you don't, when you don't have the ability to get rid of the old damaged bone tissue and you're forcing more mineral into the bone using these types of medications, those bones become more brittle. And this is where microfracturing occurs. And we actually learn this because of the field of dentistry. Dentists were noticing that women who were taking these medications were much more substantially likely to develop fractures in their jaw after having procedures done. And that's how that research, that's how that research came to be, is the dentist actually discovered that women on bisphosphonates had greater risk of microfracturing of their jaw when going through dental procedures. Now, there's something else called osteonecrosis that we know these drugs can cause. Osteonecrosis is a fancy way of saying bone death. Osteo meaning bone, necrosis, or necrotic meaning death. It's a way to kill your bone. So these bisphosphonates actually have been shown to destroy the bone itself because when you stop the breakdown of bone tissue, you damage the bone. And we know, so these two are major side effects of what can occur as a result of taking bisphosphonates. But there's another one, and one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this because many of you watching this show are gluten sensitive. And so you've already struggled with your fair share of gastrointestinal problems. You should know that one of the other side effects of bisphosphonate class of medications is erosion of the intestine and esophagus. 
So we'll just put GI tract here. So very common to see this as a side effect is, it, it, is the erosion of the esophagus. So it can lead to severe heartburn, severe damage to the esophagus, to the stomach, and to the intestine. So, you know, when you, when you get the diagnosis of osteoporosis, if it's based on a bone scan, and the bone scan is the sole thing that was done to make the decision as to whether your bone is healthy or whether your bone is, 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 is not healthy, you've been misled because a DEXA doesn't tell you whether your bone is healthy. A DEXA tells you whether or not your bone is absorbing x-rays as compared to a 35-year-old female. So again, going back to the flaw, or rather to the myth, of the diagnosis didn't even exist. Now osteoporosis existed before 1994, but the rampant diagnosis of osteoporosis did not. Again, prior 1994, before we had technology to look at bone density, it was a very rare disease, very rarely discussed because it wasn't that common and it was asymptomatic and, and, and the only people that really struggled with it were the severe bedridden elderly. And one of the reasons why it were, there were bedridden people that struggled the most with bones and fracture issues is because for bone, there's a law you know, of bone called Wolf's Law, Wolf. And what this means is, in a nutshell, it means use it or lose it, meaning bone grows based on pressure. So if you're not using your bone, if you're in bed, if you're lying down, if you're in an elderly hospital ward, if you or in an elderly home in a wheelchair sitting on your spine all day but not really exercising, then your bone starts to diminish because bone grows based on pressure. If you don't have pressure on the bone, the bone will start to demineralize and break down because your body is smart. It recognizes that when you don't use the bone, it's going to break it down and use those resources elsewhere. So the law of bone or Wolf's Law, use it or lose it, is really the biggest factor in whether or not your bone is going to be healthy or not is how much you move, it's how much you exercise, not whether or not you take this type of medication and not whether or not a bone scan tells you whether or not you're absorbing x-rays in your bone as well as a 35-year-old female. So understand that your bone works on this premise and the way we stimulate bone growth is activity, mobility, exercise. Now, one of the things that has happened since 1994 in this regard is that we do have a more sedentary workforce, but that doesn't explain the rampant diagnosing of pre-osteoporosis or, pre or osteopenia and osteoporosis. Um, it doesn't explain it at all. What explains it is the poor misuse and misguidance uh, of, of the DEXA bone scan as a tool to measure and judge the end-all be-all of the health of the bone. It doesn't take into consideration the microstructure of the bone, it doesn't take into consideration the exercise habits of a person. It doesn't take into consideration the nutritional status of an individual. It doesn't take into consideration the flexibility of an individual. It doesn't take into consideration the absorption and resorption of this process and how fast that process is actually happening. It doesn't take in anything into consideration except x-ray absorption. And how can we use such a test to give or to dispense a class of medications with so many different dangerous side effects in the name of prevention, right? In the name of prevention. And the fact of the matter is, is that we shouldn't be. And if you've been told you have osteoporosis and your doctor's not willing to have this conversation with you, I highly encourage that you find a doctor who will have that conversation with you. Now, if you're talking about some tests that might help you get better information, a DEXA is a screening test, but I don't recommend that you hold too much weight in it. There are a number of independent researching firms that have actually gone back and looked at DEXA scans and the use of bone building medications and found that your risk of fracture isn't improved when you do these things and found that actually using a DEXA scan is not a valuable tool because it doesn't really help predict who's going to have a fracture and who's not going to have a fracture. As I mentioned earlier, a study out of Leeds University found that 63% of the fractures actually occurred, or rather, the, the vast majority of fractures occurred in people that had the highest bone density scores. So using bone density as a DEXA scan to, to, to evaluate your bone health is a poor idea. Now there is a test that can be done. It's called a bone resorption test. And this is a urine test. And you can ask your doctor to run it if you'd like to know how fast your bone is breaking down 
comparatively speaking. The test bone resorption is called deoxypyridinoline, and there's another test called pyridinium, pyridinium cross linkages or cross links. And those tests measure proteins coming out in the urine that help you to understand how fast your bone is breaking down versus how fast your bone is being rebuilt. And so if you have a suspicion that you might have a problem with bone loss, having a bone resorption urine output test measured is a good place to begin the process. But the other thing that you should do is you should also ask your doctor to assess your nutrition. So number one, we can do bone resorption. Number two, we can ask for an assessment of nutrition status. And this includes things like vitamin D, and obviously a number of the minerals that help in the matrix of bone like calcium, magnesium, copper, zinc, selenium, chromium, vanadium, boron, etc. It's important to assess that nutrition. It's important to assess the speed at which your bone is breaking down. It's important to assess whether or not you exercise or have a sedentary lifestyle. Like these are the things that should give you clues or insights into the health of your bone far more than any DEXA scan could. Now an x-ray can also be used, you can measure, you can take an x-ray or a picture, an image of somebody's skeleton, but that doesn't really show you anything early on. It only, you can see bone thinning in an x-ray, but only in, in majorly osteoporotic people. You don't really see early onset of bone loss in a standard x-ray. So like if you were to go uh, to your local doctor and they had an x-ray of you, that's not the best tool, again, to use to assess bone, although in somebody who has severe bone loss, we might see that showing up on an x-ray. It's more important to assess these factors, how much you exercise, what's your quality of nutrition, and to, from a lab perspective, bone resorption is much more, a much more effective means of identifying the quality of a person's bone. So, going back to the myth, if you've had this done, you've been given osteoporotic or osteopenic diagnosis, you've been told that you need to take these medications, my advice to you would be to have a more in-depth conversation about doing something other than DEXA to help evaluate your bone. And if your doctor's not willing to look at that, it's because they haven't stayed abreast of the literature, they haven't stayed abreast of the research around the inadequacy of using a DEXA scan as a marker for bone health. So that being said, I want to dive into some of your questions tonight as well. Okay, let's see. A lot of you asking what supplements I recommend. Um, there's a ton of formulations. You know, you, one of the standard pieces of advice that you hear coming out of most OBGYNs and most general practitioners is take calcium, right? Go over and buy you some Citracal over at CVS or, you know, the local drugstore. It's horrible advice because you may not need calcium. Calcium, a calcium deficiency can cause poor bone density, but a, a poor bone density is not just caused by a calcium deficiency. And so just taking calcium for the sake of taking calcium without assessing calcium is a bad idea. So those of you who are asking, you know, what supplements or what nutrients can I take? There are a number of different formulas that people take. Most of them contain vitamin D. Most of them contain calcium. Many of them contain vanadium and boron and vitamin K because those are important for bone health as well. But at the end of the day, get with a functional doc and assess your nutrition. Find out what you're low in so that you know what is going to match you, what's going to work for you, not just here, take a bunch of pills, because pills don't create strong bone either. Remember, good nutrition comes with food, but the supplements themselves, if there's a problem in your bone, it generally has to do with either there's a poor food choice issue, a poor exercise issue, or some other quality of life issue like sedentary lifestyle it's leading to the demineralization or the weakening of the bone and not so much because you don't have enough calcium from CVS or a supplement. So I, I say that to not say that don't take supplements and that don't look at supplements as a possible alternative because many people do, but don't just rely on supplements uh, as a means to build your bone. Supplements are supplemental to exercise. They're supplemental to good nutrition. They're supplemental to your to what you do, right? If you sit at a desk all day and you don't take time to get exercise, you're going to lose your bone no matter how many 
calcium pills that you swallow. Let's see here. What exercise? I like this. Pamela says, what exercise do you recommend to keep the bone healthy? Lots of them, and I like that question because there's some really good strategies for exercise here. One of them that works really well, the science on, on, on this is, if you've ever heard of whole body vibration, I don't know, Alan, if we can put a link up to whole body vibration, but uh, if you guys want to read a little bit more about it, we'll try to get a link up in the feed for you. Um, Whole body vibration, which is a technology that was developed by the space program. Actually, the Russian space program developed it because astronauts going up in space would lose bone density. Because remember Wolf's Law? I told you the law of bone, which is without pressure, bone starts to, it starts to diminish. And so when there's no gravity, there's no pressure, right? So the bone shrinks rapidly in space. So when they come home, uh, technologists and, 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 and the scientists wanted to know, how could we rehab these astronauts? more quickly and more effectively. And this is where whole body vibration came from. It's, a, it's an oscillating platform. It oscillates at certain frequencies that helps stimulate the pressure that stimulates your bone to grow. So this is one of the great ways, I would say, if you've got a whole body vibration machine, some people buy them and put them in their house, which is not a bad idea. I have actually, I have one in my garage, in my, in my home gym, uh, and, I, and I stretch on it. I stretch on whole body vibration units because it enhances your stretching, but at the same time stimulates your bone and stimulates your lymphatic fluid and it stimulates, uh, it stimulates muscle growth. So it, it's, it can be a very, very effective way to exercise. And you, you can do a lot of different exercises on a whole body, body vibration platform. I like to do squats. I like to do push-ups. I like to do plank holds. Uh, I like to do lunges. So those are all exercises that can be done. And so, and so you can do them on a whole body vibration machine or you can do them on the ground. You don't need a whole body vibration machine to help stimulate bone growth. You just need weight bearing activity. And so weight bearing activity could be, uh, again, your body weight, push-ups, pull-ups, squats, lunges, planks, jump ropes, trampoline, rebounding trampolines work really well. Like these are all things that are natural gravitational forces that are gonna stimulate your bone to grow. You don't need to put 300 pounds on your back and squat it to have a strong spine. Um, that being said, if you like to lift weights, you can lift weights, but you don't have to. It's not a necessity. And many of you listening are women who don't want to lift a bunch of heavy weight. So again, you don't have to lift heavy weight in order to increase your bone density. You just have to exercise consistently, right, over time to increase your bone density. So good question as far as what kinds of exercises um, let's see here. What are the best foods to add to your diet? If you're trying to build bone, look, the best foods to add to your diet, we got to think about what the matrix of bone is made out of. It's collagen, right? Which is protein. Very, very important. Now that collagen matrix, so many of you do like collagen powders, uh, and that's fine. Bone broth is another good option. There's a lot of rich collagen in it. There are a lot of tissues that you can consume, uh, meat tissue, bone tissue, cartilage tissue is going to all be rich in collagen that's going to help stimulate your bone growth. It's going to supply the backbone for your, for your bone, literally. Then we also, that's one kind of option for you. But one of the missing elements to good bone health is not eating enough green leafy vegetables. So think of this as spinach, kale, chard, uh, mustard greens, beet greens, you know, you want dark green leafy vegetables and e even things like uh, broccoli and Brussels sprouts. Those things will contain high levels of vitamin K. Now, vitamin K helps to build the backbone structure of your bones. So it's very, very important. And most of your vitamin K is going to come from dark green leafy. So you got to have a lot of green on your plate as well. You can't just pound the protein and the fat. Many of you on the ketogenic diet. Um, I, see, I see that as being one of the bigger downfalls if you're not eating enough vegetables on a ketogenic diet. And look, you can be on a ketogenic diet, eat plenty of vegetables, but many of you aren't. So you want to consider lots of greens because of the vitamin K and because a lot of the minerals are also in those vegetables. So a lot of the minerals that go into building the microarchitecture of your bone are importantly found in dark green leafies as well. So those are some big foods that you want to make sure that probably most people are missing from their diet or those are the big two that I see. But then the, uh, the rest of them, you know, again, assess your nutrition. My advice to you is eat, we eat what is seasonally available. Eat real food that is seasonally available when the season is here and you'll do your best at maximizing your nutrition 
without supplements and then test to see what supplements you might need in addition to what your diet currently looks like. Should you exercise the same if you are over 50? I've heard a lot of different opinions on this. You know, that's a great question, Sandy. And um, I'm going to answer that with a story. So one of the most amazing things I've ever seen was a, I don't remember how old she, I think she was in her 90s, mid-90s. Is It It was a oriental woman. She, she was being interviewed by a, by a major news station and she scrambled up the tree like a squirrel. I mean, nimble as you could imagine, nimble as an eight-year-old child, nimble as a 14-year-old child. And, and the reporter was just drop-jawed when he watched her do that. And she scrambled up that tree to grab a piece of fruit and scrambled right back down and started eating it. And the reporter was just like, holy cow, I can't believe that. How did you do that? And her, ample, her answer was so simple. It was, I never stopped. In essence, you shouldn't exercise like a 50-year-old. You should exercise. Now, many of you are deconditioned, meaning that you haven't exercised in such a long time that and you're deconditioned, meaning if you were to try to exercise like you did when you remember being 18 and active and involved in sports or whatever it might be, that that could be a problem for you. You don't want to be the weekend warrior that damages or injures yourself because you try to do what you used to could do when you were 18 not because you shouldn't be able to do it when you're 50. Look, I'm almost 50 and I can do everything I used to do when I was 18. And the reason why is I didn't become deconditioned. And so many of, many of us have become deconditioned with a lack of activity. So when you're first starting out, if exercise is new to you and it's something that you're bringing in for the first time in a long time, then those opposite opinions you hear are correct, which is start slow, but work your strength and work your way up. So you have to start your exercise at the level of strength and conditioning that you're at. Don't try to exercise aggressively the way a marathoner might because they've been training for years. If you haven't been training for years, you have to start where you're at. And so my best advice I can give you on that front is if, you don't, if you're not really sure, is hire somebody with at least 10 years of experience and working with people who are deconditioned, who do not have the muscle tone and the muscle strength and the flexibility that is that was typical of their earlier days. Hire somebody who's got experience in training those types of individuals. Don't hire you some young trainer who's gung-ho and took a weekend training course on personal training because I see a lot of people get injured from, from those types of trainers. And that's not to say there aren't good young trainers either. My point is simply to say, Hire somebody who's got some experience at helping you become reconditioned if you are deconditioned. Okay. All right, Dickerson, thank you. Ed Dickerson says, this is outstanding information. I'm glad you're finding it helpful. Yeah, Chucho says... You know, this is this sad, Chucho. Thanks for chiming in. Chucho says, I just visited a new internal medicine doctor... I asked for a vitamin mineral panel and her response was, why? Yeah, that is so sad. I mean, look, the reality is this. If your doctor is poo-pooing nutrition, right? That's probably because they're not trained in it and they don't want to admit it. See, one of the problems with doctors is ego. Ego gets in the way. And I'm not saying that, um, that this is the case for every doctor, but a lot of doctors... They, they, they scoff at nutrition not because it isn't important. They scoff at it because they don't understand it or because the one small class that they took in medical school 20 years ago or 15 years ago was not a class on nutrition. It might have been called nutrition, but it was a class on anti-nutrition. It was a simple class that told them, look, nutrition's not all that important. Focus on drugs and you'll do just fine. Like That's the class that's taught in most schools. Most schools don't have adequate nutritional training. There's a number of studies that have been conducted across medical schools in the world that found that nutritional training was very, very extremely lacking in terms of the quality of the core curriculum they were being exposed to. So if you're going to a medical doctor, understand you're not going to somebody with the training. The problem is, is they don't admit that they don't have the training and they poo-poo the nutrition. And so you think, oh, well, they're a medical doctor. They must have had the training. And the reality is they didn't. So you should know that so that you could make an informed decision about how you can assess the information that they're sharing with you so they don't share something with you that ends up misleading you. Okay. 
Let me see here. Yeah, so Dad says, my medical doctor prescribed dairy products, exercise, and calcium supplements because of my osteoporosis. First of all, dairy, you know, today's dairy, if you're buying it out of the grocery store, you're buying dairy that's full of hormones, that's full of meat glue, that's full of processed additives. It is not going to help you restore bone. And that type of dairy, you know, arguably, if you're, especially if you're gluten sensitive, is just going to mimic a gluten reaction. And one of the causes of osteoporosis aside from these things, and we didn't really dive into that tonight, but one of the causes of osteoporosis is autoimmunity. It's, it's actually been discovered. There was a research study published oh, a couple of decades ago on the autoimmunity of osteoporosis, meaning that just like you can have autoimmune thyroid disease, autoimmune liver disease, autoimmune intestinal disease, you can have autoimmune bone loss. And so many of you have developed osteoporosis as a result of autoimmunity. And dairy is a bad idea because dairy is a very autoimmunogenic food. It's one of the three food groups that are commonly avoided for people with autoimmune disease. What are they? Gluten, dairy, and sugar, right? Although we, I wouldn't really classify sugar as a food group, but gluten, grains, and, and uh, dairy, and sugar are three of the foods that are the most promoting of autoimmune disease. So to, to say to eat more dairy product to correct your bone loss is, in my opinion, unless you've got your own specialized cows, um, bad, bad advice. Okay, Glenda says, yes, I want to exercise, but getting put, off, uh, uh, getting put off the floor is such a challenge. What would you recommend? Glenda, I'd recommend getting on the floor and getting up off the floor and getting on the floor and getting up off the floor. It's going to be a challenge until you condition yourself. If you're that deconditioned where you have a hard time getting up and down off the floor, then you've got to start with maybe start with a taller bench where you sit on a taller bench and you get up, but you work those legs and you start working those muscles, start waking them up. Because they've been asleep for so long, they don't have the strength to pull you off the floor. They don't have the capacity or the balance. Remember, there's a lot of factors to your muscle and your bone. And one of them is balance and one of them is strength and integrity and flexibility. And so you've got to start somewhere. So you start with what you're capable of doing. So that means hiring somebody to help you get off the floor. Then hire somebody to help you get off the floor. But get down on the floor and get up off the floor. Don't use the fact that it's a hard for you to do as the excuse. Because if you do, you're going to pay a major price in your life and your health. Uh, is dairy essential for bones? I think I answered that question. No, it's not. Is swimming good? Bozina wants to know, is swimming good? Bozina, swimming's great, but swimming mimics space. So going back to the law of, of gravity, or the of Wolf's Law, which is bone grows based on pressure. Now... In a swimming pool, there is some pressure if you're moving your arms and your muscles, but there's a lot less than if you're not in a swimming pool. That being said, if swimming is what you can do because you're deconditioned and maybe you're overweight, I don't know, that's a good place to start, but you want to work your way out of the pool into gravity so that you can start having that gravity resistance against your muscles and bones as well. Yeah, if you've been to doctors that don't understand nutrition and deny that it's a factor, it's time to fire them. Look, just like if you had a plumber come to your house and you wanted him to fix your toilet and he didn't fix your toilet but he made a bigger problem, would you rehire that plumber the next time you had a problem? No. If they're not listening to you, it's time to move on. Uh, so many people think that the doctor-patient relationship is dictatorial and there's not a conversation or a two-way communication and it's sad. Really know that you have the capacity to find another doctor who's going to listen and who's going to have a meaningful conversation with you. Thanks for chiming in. Dickerson says, nutrition was not taught at the med school I attended, nor where I received my master's in oriental medicine. I had to take a post-grad course to get the information, and a lot of doctors do. I mean, I was taught nutrition in grad school, but the amount of nutrition I was taught versus what I had to go on in graduate school was minuscule. So my experience was, was not quite the same, but similar. In essence, if you want nutritional training, doctors have to seek it out. So the, the doctors that really value it are the ones that love, uh, that love it. And so they're the ones that you really want to get excited about going and seeing. And that's why you know if you're interviewing doctors, you should ask them, what training have you received outside of your traditional education because most of them didn't have 
traditional education. Sue says, I'm 64, still shovel and rake the yard, still play with my toddler, grandchildren have good stamina, I stay away from the doctor <laughs> and have a naturopath. That's awesome, Sue. I'm glad that you're 64 and still doing all those wonderful things. I'd love to hear back from you when you're 84 still doing them too. So Diane Morgan wants to know, if you can't name names here of worthwhile vibrating plates, can you let us know how to evaluate them? I can say the simplest way to evaluate a vibration plate is that if it costs less than $1,000, then it isn't worth purchasing. Um, the technology and the, and the frequency of the hertz that these things have to vibrate at, it, it's going to cost a little bit of money to get one. I don't know if we posted that link up to vibration or not, but um, we did. So, so Diane, check our feed. Check the, the feed and, and that link should be in there where you can go read more about vibration. Okay, let's see. Rebecca says, my bones are popping everywhere. What do you think the reason is? Could be lots of reasons. I mean, bone popping itself is not necessarily a bad thing or a, or a disease. Um, a lot of people have cracking, uh, have cracking knee joints or cracking elbows, etc. cetera. Uh, it's, again, it's not necessarily a breakdown or a disease process, but a lot of people who have excessive popping are not flexible, not super flexible, or they have muscular imbalances. So you might get evaluated in that regard, if, especially if you find that those are those pops are painful. Now, if those pops aren't painful, I wouldn't worry so much about it. Colin wants to know if almond milk is a good substitute for regular milk. You don't need a substitute for milk, Colin. Um, almond milk is not a great product. It's not a great food. It's, it's almond milk. If you want really eat almonds, right, and drink some water, that's your best almond milk, in my opinion. A lot of people want to kind of mimic the milk in their lifestyle or in their diet. But it's not necessary, and my point is you don't need a substitute for milk. Courtney says, as a trainer, I work with a ton of older deconditioned clients and have them do balance work and things that will help with bone density. It doesn't take much to see improvement, just consistency. You're absolutely right, Courtney. Thank you for chiming in. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, balance is important, especially for, for elderly people who have lost their balance. Rita wants to know if osteopenia can be a result of leaky gut. Uh, I also have iron deficiency anemia. Those are the only symptoms I have. So number one, Rita, is find out why you have iron deficiency anemia. Is it because you're not eating enough iron or is it because, you're, because your gut is damaged and you're not absorbing iron properly, which is extremely common for those people with gluten sensitivity or celiac disease where the area of the small intestine that absorbs iron is damaged so we start to develop iron deficiency. Other problems that can cause iron deficiency are, you know, uh, menstrual cycles. If your menstrual cycles are very heavy, that can cause iron loss. Other ways that we'll see commonly iron loss is people that are taking medications that can damage the GI tract. Aspirin is a perfect example. It can cause gastric bleeding and intestinal erosion, leading to occult blood loss and slow iron loss over time, leading to iron deficiency anemia. So that needs to be investigated. You want to understand why that's happening, not just taking an iron supplement. But why is that actually happening? Uh, but to answer your question about whether or not leaky gut can cause osteopenia, yes, I said earlier that osteoporosis, osteopenia has been identified as an autoimmune disease. Leaky gut is the precursor to autoimmune disease. So leaky gut can definitely contribute in that regard to autoimmune bone loss. Yeah, so Dana says, that's why my internist told me to wear a 10-pound vest when walking. Yeah, I mean, the 10-pound vest is going to add some pressure. Uh, but honestly, I don't even think you need necessarily to worry about a 10-pound vest. You just need to walk. You just need to get out there and, and you know, body weight activity is best. Okay. I think I answered those questions already about that. Is it, okay, Marisol says, is it true you need a bone density scan after a year of missing your period? No. Marisol, I don't know if you were listening earlier on, 
I don't recommend bone scans. Bone scans are highly misleading, in my opinion. Let's just call it what it is. They're propaganda machines to, to prescribe drugs. Um, DEXAs do not evaluate your bone health. They evaluate how well it absorbs x-ray, and that is it. And all the research, all the new research says that knowing whether or not you have a good DEXA score or a bad DEXA score does not predict whether or not you're going to have a bone fracture from osteoporosis. As a matter of fact, the people that have the greatest bone density scores on a DEXA scan have the highest level of fractures according to recent research. So my point is DEXA scans are pretty much a waste of time. Bone resorption, assess your nutrition, make sure you're exercising. Okay, that's, that's where it's at in terms of osteoporosis. Remember before 1994, Nobody really ever heard much about osteo osteoporosis unless they were an elderly person that actually experienced a fracture. So, you know, a pretty rare disease that has been popularized by technology that's misleading. And in my opinion, doctors are not trained in that misleading component. And really, people are getting these scans done without proper informed consent. They're being recommended drugs without proper informed consent because they're not being told you know, the accuracy of what these machines are actually capable of revealing. Hey, you don't have to be sorry, Marisol. I thought I'd just let you go back and watch the, watch the replay. Um, let's see here. I'm 40, have been having trauma implants for 10 years and osteoporosis for about six. Do you suggest getting rid of implants to avoid inflammation? Um, yeah, if the implants are causing the inflammation, but again, it goes back to whether or not that's what's causing it. You want to determine whether or not they're causing it before you go have a surgery done to remove something. What liquid do you add to your smoothie? Um, Susan wants to know water. It's the best liquid in the world. You're 70% water. Why not add water? Novel idea, right? Add water to that smoothie. And if you want kind of more of a sweet flavor or taste, you can add different uh, berries or other things that, you know, some people add a half a banana. Some people add, you know, raspberries, blueberries, blackberries. Patrice says, I've ha I have a severe vitamin D deficiency at 11, her level is 11. Um, can this, can this cause this? Yeah, I can. I mean, vitamin D deficiency causes bone loss. And the reason why, um, why does vitamin D cause bone loss? So your intestines absorb calcium. Your intestinal cells absorb calcium under the influence of vitamin D. So vitamin D activates the genetic code in the intestinal lining or the cells of the intestine. And it tells those cells to start absorbing calcium from the food that you eat. So a person with vitamin D deficiency could be eating all the calcium, but if their vitamin D levels are low, their intestines don't have the capacity to absorb the calcium from the food that they're eating. So vitamin D can definitely cause calcium loss, which can lead to, you know, can lead to demineralization of bone. It's definitely a possibility, and that's part of why it's important to have that nutritional level assessed. Yeah, so those of you without sunshine, that's really kind of one of the problems, right, is the lack of sunshine, the lack of vitamin D. Um, and for those of you who live 27 degrees north latitude and higher, um, you really want to focus, my advice would be to focus on, um, on getting you a, uh, a vitamin D level check. Yeah, every kind of coming out of summer when the, when the days get shorter, you want to get your vitamin D levels checked at that time. Get them checked at kind of midwinter again and make sure you're optimizing those vitamin D levels to be at least 50 so that you're not um, running that risk of vitamin D-induced calcium deficiency. Oh, I love this question. Jeanette wants to know, is there a link between osteoporosis and vitamin B12 deficiency? I have both been on injections for three years and 54 years old. Yes, there is. So vitamin B12 deficiency will say low B12 causes an elevation in a compound known as homocysteine. Now homocysteine, we all make homocysteine. It's a normal byproduct of human metabolism, but homocysteine elevations damage bone. 
And so one of the things you might do is ask your doctor to measure your homocysteine level and see if that's playing a role. Now, you can have low B12 and not have high homocysteine. That's a possibility. So just because your B12 is low doesn't mean that homocysteine elevations are causing damage to your bone. That's why I, would, I recommend that you ask your doctor to measure those homocysteine levels to determine whether that's happening for you. Let's see. Sue says, I take vitamin D 10,000 units a day. Is that too much? Depends, Sue. It depends on what your level was when you started, and it depends on whether or not you're periodically checking your D to make sure it's too little or too much. I mean, I see people with, I mean, I put people on 10,000 units all the time, but I'm also measuring and monitoring their levels so that we don't get it too high either. You don't want your vitamin D levels to go too high for too long either. So, Again, the best rule of thumb there is if you're going to take that much, 10,000 units is a strong dose on a daily basis. Ask your doctor to measure your 25 OHD levels periodically to make sure you're not overshooting the mark. Yeah, I love this. So Linda says, thanks for covering this topic. I didn't break a bone until I fell on the hard ice. And uh, I feel better now about not getting the prolia injection, that toxic poison that doctors want to drive into your body, in my opinion. Um, yeah, I mean, if you fall on ice, ice is hard. You're going you're gonna to fracture something. I mean, falls and breaking bones don't mean you have weak bones. If you hit the bone just right, you can fracture it. I've fractured bones. Um, so, you know, bottom line, don't let fear, don't let fear propaganda convince you that you need to inject a drug into your body to, because your body is somehow so broken it can't make its own bone properly or to take a pill every day that can create bone death and other bone problems uh, as, a, as, a as a substitute for intelligent lifestyle change. Okay. Let's see here. I think I answered that one. All right, Rufina, thanks for the compliment. Love you too. Okay, answered that one. Does body pH being acidic influence osteoporosis? Um, define body pH, Susan, because there are different chambers in your body and the different levels of pH at different areas in your body. For example, the, the pH in your saliva is a little bit different than the pH in your intestines and in your stomach. The pH in your blood is a little bit different. So some people will say blood pH. If you're talking about systemic blood-based pH, yes. If your blood level is too acidic, it's high, more on an acidic side, even kind of low acidic side, it can cause mineral leaching from your bone. And how does a person develop an overall increase in acidity uh, and overall pH systemically? And that's by eating sugar and processed food. And so if you're not eating sugar and processed food, you really shouldn't struggle with too much acidity. There is a myth that meat causes too much acidity in the body. It is a myth that meat causes acidity. Meat does not cause too much acidity in the body. Now, if you're strictly carnivore, only eating meat, and you're not getting any of the, of the mineral bases, then yeah, you could create a problem. But if you are balanced diet, lots of veggies, lots of, uh, lots of meat, lots of fats, nuts, healthy foods, you shouldn't so much have to worry about measuring your pH um, and, and, and being so, uh, I guess we'll say scared that your pH is going to influence your bone in a negative way. Okay. Rebecca asks, what causes teeth to go bad and crack? Lots of things. Um, but bone plays a role in that for many people with gluten sensitivity. There've been a number of research studies that show that gluten exposure to the teeth actually erodes the enamel and weakens the tooth itself. An infection can weaken the tooth. Poor hygiene of the mouth can weaken the teeth. Sugar can weaken the teeth. There are a lot, I mean, there are lots of different things that can cause that. Um, going back to how do you know what caused yours, it's getting with a, I just can't emphasize this enough, getting with a solid functional medicine practitioner to, um, to get that dialed in is the best thing you can do because, again, it's kind of like what causes fatigue? Lots of things cause fatigue. What's causing your fatigue is the more important question, and, and I use fatigue as a, replacement for my teeth cracking, right? So um, it just depends. Depends on the person, depends on the scenario. 
Oh, love it, Deepa. What's my thought on osteoporosis due to a parathyroid adenoma? Can you recover the bone density once it's been removed? Depends on the, the length of time you had the adenoma and how quickly you got it removed and how bad the bone density was. But I firmly believe, and I've seen it happen, where, where people with severe osteoporosis were able to improve their bone density. So the number one rule of healing, as you know, is hope. Is, is hope. The number two rule of healing is to educate yourself and make change. And so with a tumor like an adenoma, it's a, it's a little bit more challenging. So the first step in that scenario is diagnosis and removal. Uh, but yes, I do believe you can recover it. Oh, Carrie asks, what is my opinion on removing mercury fillings? Okay, so yeah, anytime you have a silver amalgam in your mouth, understand that there are mul it's not just mercury, there are other metals in that amalgam, but if the amalgam is not stable, if it's broken down and it's releasing, you're releasing vapor, that that mercury can disrupt and create a mineral disruption among other things it can be a neurotoxin and as a neurotoxin it can create a lot of neurological types of symptoms but how can it affect the bone or can it affect the bone and the answer to that is yes it potentially can affect the bone so what's my opinion on having them removed um, my opinion is to find a good environmental dentist and have it assessed sometimes they need to be removed right away sometimes they don't just because you have a silver amalgam doesn't mean it's unstable and needs to be removed right away. Remember, when you remove them, you run the risk of poisoning yourself because when, when you break a stable amalgam, you can create a problem. So removal should be justified. One of the things I recommend people do is get tested for mercury. Get a, what's called a pre and post provocation test for, for mercury toxicity to see if the mercury is part of your issue. And if it is, then that's when you want to get with a, a dentist who's been properly trained in the safe removal of mercury or silver amalgams. And, and I say safe, not safe for him, safe for you. There's a specific way, there's an organization in dentistry called IAOMT. And you can go to that website, IAOMT.org, because these, this is a group of environmentally trained dentists who believe that removing silver amalgams has to be done in a way that protects the patient. And so that's who you want removing yours. You don't want to just go to a dentist. Yes, they were all trained. Yes, they're all doctors. But you don't want to just go to any dentist who's, who doesn't have specific and specialized training in the proper protection of you in removing that silver amalgam. Remember, those amalgams are classified by the EPA as a biohazard. Okay, hopefully that answers your question. We're getting ready to wrap up, folks. So, yeah, I think I answered that one already, too. Yeah, so Doug says, government shut my ND, my naturopathic doctor, down. They didn't like her helping people naturally. Hey, on that note, um, I, think, I think any of you listening who want to protect your ability to see natural doctors and... You should, you should con contact your congressman. You should contact your senator. You, could, you should contact your representatives, your state representatives, and demand that you have all, always have access to that type of care. Look, there's a war going on right now in natural medicine. Make no mistake about it. There's a real war that's, that's being enacted, and it's because the Internet has evened the playing field. A person can go get a massive quantity of data and information in a very short period of time, and many people are challenging kind of the status quo of what the medical community has been saying for the past 30, 40 years. And that challenge comes as a threat. And so it's not to say that doctors are bad and think people are out to get them. It's not to say your doctor is bad or evil, but the powers that be are definitely trying to shut down a lot of what happens in natural medicine. So you make sure you go out and support uh, and support your natural docs by making sure you contact your, your legislative branch of your government to ensure they always have a place. Okay, let's see here. Okay, I've answered that one. I answered that one. I think we covered pretty much all of it. Last one. I'll take one more. Elizabeth asks, does osteoarthritis affect bone density? Um, osteoarthritis is a different process than osteoporosis. Osteoarthritis 
is an inflammatory process, but it depends on what's driving it. So, so you know, there are a lot of things that can drive inflammation. For most people, if we're talking about true osteoarthritis, we're talking about either some type of sedentary behavior that is allowed for the joint to degradate and become inflamed, such as sitting at a desk all day, or a, a severe enough injury that's damaged the cartilage and created a, a, an injurious inflammation process within the joint. Uh, in that regard, it will create an increased risk for developing poor bone density or increasing your risk for osteopenia osteoporosis if the arthritis is so painful that you're not being active. So where osteoarthritis predominantly would affect somebody would be if the pain of the, of the arthritis inhibits the person's motion or movement and creates a sedentary aspect of their life which leads to a degradation of their bone through uh, through bone microarchitectural change, removing the bone because the bone's not being used because the person's not act, not being active, if that makes sense. So, again, I think we got to wrap it up, folks. I, I've got more questions coming in, but um, it's that time. So, if you enjoyed this, please make sure you comment. I like to see your feedback and hear your commentary. And also, if you don't subscribe, hit the subscribe button. And hit the share button. Look, our mission here at Dr. Osborne is to try to help 100 million people. We're trying to save 100 million lives. So in that regard, I can't do it without your help. Just like I'm here every Monday night trying to help you, I need your help. I need you to share this message so that we can get people educated. So hashtag save 100 million lives. Make sure you visit me at glutenfreesociety.org. If you haven't already, subscribe to us there. That's how you get updates. And we'll send you a gluten-free survival guide at no charge. This is Dr. Osborne wishing you excellent health. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday.